Hello, friends. Hey, it's Master Sunday. How are we doing, everybody? The Mothership has connected. Welcome aboard. So glad you're with us on another edition of Watch DA Live every Sunday night at 7 o'clock Eastern Time for Pacific. Boy, we have such a great show lined up, and cheers to everybody out there. As you might imagine, I'm sipping on... My friends from Bakta, their bourbon, 2014, it's delicious. They've sponsored the show over the first month of this and given away a couple of gift cards to our bracket challenge winners. We'll get to that coming up here shortly, but thanks to Bakta. You guys are phenomenal. We just got this thing off the ground a little over a month ago. Bakta were the first to say, we want a board, we want on, we love what you do, we want to connect with your listeners and your audience so appreciate Bakta very much, and it is delicious. More on that coming up here. Our guests tonight are just phenomenal. We've got legendary Nickelodeon host Mark Summers joining us here on the show. How about this? I mean, if you grew up in the 80s or early 90s, you know that Mark Summers was as big of a part of your life as just about anybody on TV because Double Dare changed everything about children's programming. It was the first kids game show. And Nickelodeon was the first network dedicated solely to children. And I remember not having cable growing up. We didn't get cable in my house until I was in high school and having to go over to my cousin's house to go watch Double Dare. And I loved it. And I loved it. I loved how cartoonish it was, how silly it was, how zany it was. I mean, as you might imagine, this is the type of humor that I love. So Mark Summers is going to join us here on the show. He's got a new off-Broadway play going on, a show which weaves together his own life and Double Dare. I can't wait to talk to him about that. Also, sports betting analyst Lucy Burge is going to join us. If you've listened to my radio show over the last couple of years, Lucy's been a regular guest. She's hysterical. She knows what she's talking about. She's going to help us walk through golf betting, okay, and NBA playoff betting. And we'll get to the NBA playoff standings as well, but we're going to need a little bit of, of help here now that the Masters is just about over, which kind of kicks off the golf season. And we'll do the Furious Five plus one throughout the, throughout the night. All right, so that's all coming up this morning, or this evening, I should say, on the show. Also... We're going to do something called Golden Grams, which I'm very, very excited about. Okay, everybody? Now, check this out. If you've been listening to the show, watching the show, tune into this show, Sunday nights, we've built a bit of an audience that, that enjoys maybe a cocktail, a beverage, maybe some food. People kind of wind down with their weekend, and they jump aboard the evening mothership. And... We've had so many people say, this is kind of my nightly routine. This is my Sunday night routine. We said, why don't we actually have people send in what they're drinking, what they're eating, what they're doing? And so we've created a way that you can share what you're drinking or what you're eating or what you're doing as you watch Watch DA Live. Just take a picture of it if you want to share a cocktail, your dish, whatever you're doing as you, you watch. And just tag me on Instagram, just at Damon Amendo on Instagram. Just tag me in that picture. I will repost you on my Instagram feed. And then Aiden's going to pull the best of and put it together in a segment we like to call Golden Grams for the Gram later on in the program so that every night you guys as a community get to share what you're doing and people get to see, kind of touch base with what everybody else is doing as they watch the show. So once again, take a photo of what you got, cocktail, food, otherwise. Tag me on Instagram. Just post it on your Instagram of tag me at Damon Amendo. I'll repost it, and then we'll go ahead and, and post them right here on Watch DA Live. If you don't have Instagram, you can email it to us. We have an email account dedicated just to the show, Live at gmail.com. That's Live at gmail.com. How great is that? First off. Let's congratulate our Bakta winners, okay? Let's throw up the graphics here and let everybody see that we 
had a very competitive group in both the on-air bracket and the regular audience bracket, the D-Alien bracket here, okay? So check this out. Final standings. This is for the D-Aliens. You had a close race at the top, but these guys at the top, they had UConn winning it. And so SEC, we don't really know what this is. SEC op stocks? Seek op stocks? We don't really know, but we'll go with SEC op stocks. Reach out to me either on social media or on the email so I can get you this $150 gift, ca- gift card from Bakta. All right? SEC Optics or SEC Op Stocks. You got to get involved here. We'll try to reach out to you as well. But the easiest way is to make sure that you reach out to us. So congratulations, buddy. That was a big win. Just edging out some of the others for first place. Now we're standing with so many brackets that were kind of vying at the top in the the final four weekend but sec op stocks ends up pulling away congrats 150 dollars gift card to bakta which is which could go to a lot of different bottles multiple bottles or just one big bad boy the 2014 goes for 150 bucks at their spirit store online so you can get that that's awesome congratulations on to the on-air standings congratulations to the one and only artist formerly known as Mraz, he wins the $150 gift card as well. He ends up having Yukon for the victory, edging out Shep, beating out Babchick, Pete the Body, Bogues, Gelb, who all had Yukon. I, of course, had Houston. Look at me, far behind the rest of the pack. What a disgrace. Mraz finishes sixth overall in the standings, but number one of the on-air bracket. That means that the Marquette Marvel... Aiden Hatton, who had Marquette win of the whole thing, will have to eat the most sour candy on earth called Toxic Waste. We are ordering it tomorrow. It'll arrive at his house and perhaps next week on the show. If it's in tow, intact, in hand, he will have to eat it right here on the show. One sour moment. You have not seen Aiden yet on camera. This will be the first time we'll get Aiden on camera going like this. Pucker it up. So, eight in the Marquette Marvel. Get ready. Forecast pain next week right here on Watch DA. But again, once again, the good people of Bakta, you guys crush it. Thanks so much for supporting this project that we have, this weekly show, and uh, it is delicious. I'm going to take one more drink to everybody out there. Salute, good health. It's refreshing. It's not sharp. It's smooth. It's got a little, feels like a little sweetness. It's a really, really good bourbon. Really good bourbon. You guys know I'm a bourbon snob. All right. I think it's about time here to get into the action. It's the Furious Five plus one. Let's hit it, Aiden. All right. So. We got to talk about the Masters here because with the Masters, we're have, we have it wrapping up as kind of as we, we speak right now. Scotty Scheffler with a big lead. He was the favorite coming into the tournament, and he ends up now with a big lead late in the tournament as well. He's on, looks like he's on 18 now, and he's going to end up, you know, pulling away. And so congratulations to Scheffler. Remember, he had his wife who was in labor or pregnant and if she went into labor he said he was going to end up leaving the tour or leaving the the tournament to go with her to be at the hospital that didn't end up happening she's due in the next week or two scheffler has the storybook ending he ends up winning the green jacket and he just played phenomenal the entire weekend but let's talk about tiger here because he ends up just totally blowing up after making the cut there were some early reasons to believe that tiger might have his mojo back but at the end of it, he completely implodes on Saturday and then wraps it up today. It's his worst ever Masters score. It just ends up being a complete you-know-what show. And it really is a shame because it begs the question, if you en- end up at 16 over, a career worst 304, what does that mean? And I think, honestly, it just means that we can stop holding our breath for Tiger to win a major anymore. 
this is now about Tiger at an age where we don't expect guys to win majors anymore, but because Tiger's Tiger, the Tiger's body's been through so much abuse, both physical and, you know, in the car wrecks and multiple, but also, you know, the, the pain stuff that he was on and, you know, just where he was for a, for a moment in his life and how out of sorts he was. It's nice to see him back playing majors. It gives you some nostalgia and it pulls you back in, but ultimately you can't ever figure that he's going to win another major. I think that ship has sailed when you end up. And I know this was a tough course this week and a lot of wind and didn't help him out that, you know, Thursday was delayed into Friday, had to play an extended Friday, but that's about it. I, I just don't think we should ever expect Tiger to be winning majors, even contending for majors ever again. All right, next up on the Furious Five, we're talking about the NBA playoffs here. And it ends up that the Oklahoma City Thunder actually win the Western Conference one seed. How about this? This is pretty amazing. The Thunder end up winning the one seed. And, you know, for a Nuggets team that was the defending NBA champs, for the Thunder to stave them off going into game 82 and then into the playoffs, that's a huge step forward for this young franchise. But that being said, I don't think the Thunder have the horses to be able to make it through the NBA playoffs and get to the NBA finals. I think this is Denver's conference to lose. Now, I did not believe in the Nuggets last year. I really thought that they were going to struggle. They were going to have another flame out. I didn't think they were ready. So I've been wrong before on this last NBA champ. But boy, it's so early in the Thunder's development. And Shea Gilgis-Alexander is phenomenal. The type of guy that can carry a team. I still think it's a lot very early. It's an incredible thing to accomplish to be the number one overall seed at this stage. I mean, the Thunder have so many guys in their early 20s, mid-20s, and have plenty more picks as well to go. What a rebuild this has been since the Durant, Westbrook, Harden stuff. They have completely shed all of that and then you know shed the Russell Westbrook, Paul George iteration and then shed the Chris Paul iteration and now have this, and they're one of the best teams of basketball. Amazing. But I still think it's the Thunder that go down at some point to the Nuggets. I think Denver comes out of the West. No great shakes there, but I think the Eastern Conference is super interesting as the Sixers lie in the weeds as the potential seven seed or maybe the eight seed for the Celtics as the one or the Knicks as the two. Congratulations to the Knicks. They have a 50-win season. They get the two seed of the East. They fought to the bitter end. Jalen Brunson's been phenomenal. But, I mean, boy, the Celtics or the Knicks are going to draw a healthy Embiid and a healthy Tyrese Maxey in round number one. That's a tough road to hoe. And I said this this week on the radio. I thought that actually the best spot to be in is the three seed assuming the Sixers didn't get to the six. But the Bucks slide into the three, and they get the Pacers. Just knowing you get to avoid the Sixers of the first round and get the Pacers maybe with a breather and the Bucks having a banged-up Giannis, they needed something a bit of a breather in the first round to kind of get on their feet, and I think they got it. They lucked out with that three seed, and the Knicks... I give them credit for going all out for that two seed, but it could come back to bite them if the Sixers win this first playing game and end up as the seventh seed in the East. All right, that's the first two of the Furious Five. We'll get to the last three plus one a little bit later on to the show, but let's get to our first guest. What a joy this is. This is so cool. Nickelodeon legend, Double Dare legend, Food Network legend. Remember, he hosted Unwrapped. Okay, this guy's been everywhere. Also, a reminder, Golden Grams, make sure you take a picture of what you're drinking, what you're eating, what you're doing as you watch the show and tweet and put it on Instagram at me, at Damon Amendo, and we'll grab those for later on in the show as we go through this interview with Mark. But here it is. Let's bring you the great Mark Summers.
All right, my next guest is such a, a fantastic guest to have here on the show because he and I actually caught up a number of years ago at the Super Bowl, and I really, really, really enjoyed our conversation. And when I go to work every day at Sirius XM, I pass by a couple of big banner ads that I'm just totally entranced by. It's the Life in Slimes with Mark Summers, and you have that green splat like the old Double Dare show, and yep. I was just like, wow, this is so cool. So... You know Mark from his years on Double Dare between 86 and 93 on Nickelodeon, also Food Network's Unwrapped. He was the executive producer of Dinner Impossible and Restaurant Impossible. And the Life and Slimes of Mark Summers is right now doing five shows a week at the New World Stage Theater until June the 2nd. So you can go, if you're in the city, check that out. Mark Summers joining us here on the show. Mark, how you doing? I'm good. Nice to see you again. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, before it was only big sporting events, so now we can actually calm down and have a good conversation. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think people don't realize that you're, you're a huge sports fan, specifically a huge baseball fan as well, but you grew up in Indianapolis, so did you ever attach yourself to a specific baseball team? Well, we had the Indianapolis Indians, which were a AAA uh, American association, which I don't think even exists anymore. Uh, and they were initially a farm club of the Chicago White Sox. And it was fun as a kid to see uh, Claude Osteen as a pitcher go to the White Sox. And we had a guy by the name of Chico Ruiz who became, uh, he was really a sprinter and he would steal bases. Then we switched to uh, Cincinnati when the Big Red Machine was around. So I get to see a lot of people go off to there. But I, I went to school in Boston. And my dorm was right across from Fenway Park. And you could get on the roof of our building and look down into Fenway. And, of course, you know, when you don't have any money as a college kid, just seeing a third of the field is enough. Um, that and all the beer you can steal. And uh, it, was a, <laughs> it was a fun time. But now um, I'm a big fan and I go to many games and uh, hoping that we can have a winning season again. We need that. Let me tell you, I don't think anybody figured they'd tune in to hear Mark Summers and hear Chico Ruiz reference. So you have now got major credibility amongst the sports fans. Major do you know, credibility. Do you know who Chico is? Of course, yeah. Old school, yeah. Speedster, as you said, couldn't hit, but all could just could run the bases, could fly. You got to throw out the first pitch at Fenway. I mean, yes. how nerve-wracking is it to throw out a first pitch in front of the Boston fans? Well, you don't ever want to screw up at any ballpark, but especially at Fenway because that crowd could be brutal. And so um, I got up the morning of, went to a sporting goods store, bought 25 baseballs, went to a, a park uh, in Brookline, Massachusetts, and threw balls for like two, three hours. And then they told me to get to the park at five. I got there at three. And I wanted to warm up, but they said the players weren't allowed to do it for insurance reasons. So they, they let me throw with the ball girl. And I went, oh, this is going to be fun. This girl threw so hard, I had to tell her to pull back. My hand was like bulging red. <laughs> but so, I, yeah, I, I, they wanted me to stand in front of the mound. They said most people do that. I wasn't going to have any of that. I coached my son's baseball team for eight years. So I, you know, so I did it, and I actually have it on videotape. And um, it's still one of the biggest thrills in my life. That is so cool. It's funny because, you know, Double Dare is such a, an American institution, but we didn't have cable growing up. So I used to go over to my cousin's house. Huh? And this was right right at the time of, of the, the height of Double Dare. And I was like, we have to watch Double Dare. And my cousins, they grew up on it as well. So it was always on in the house. So that, that's where I got my Double Dare fix. And I'm wondering now when it comes to the audience that comes to your show, is it usually parents of children that grew up now having watched you or do they know you from all the other things you've done in your career as well well i was at food uh, well 86 to 94 was my full double dare run between uh, well double dare what would you do and um and then i did various other networks i worked at uh, history channel doing a quiz show called history iq and i uh, did a talk show on lifetime but it was 20 years at food network i tell you what's so odd i assume when people stop me for an autograph or a picture that it's a Double Dare reference, because that was probably the most popular show I ever did. Uh, but the other day, somebody was coming out of our show, Life and Slimes, and they said, can you sign my program? And I said, sure, you want me to say uh, anything about Double Dare or uh, Unwrapped? And she said to me, what's Double Dare? Wow. Yeah. So there's a wow. whole show that only knows me from the Food Network. That was kind of a wake-up call, you know? Yeah. That was interesting. So, so this... That this show that you're doing, this off-Broadway show, Life in Slimes, is part kind of game show, part interactivity of the audience like Double Dare, but also part memoir. This is also your life. So how do you weave all of that together? That seems like such an interesting puzzle to try to connect. 
lucky because a man by the name of Alex Brightman wrote my show and uh, he wrote a bulletproof show. Alex is a major star on Broadway. He first did um, School of Rock as the lead and then he did uh, Beetlejuice as the lead. He just closed in Spamalot in one of the leads. Um, uh, he also did The Shark is Broken prior to that. So he's a brilliant performer, but he may even be a better writer. And he wrote this show for me about eight years ago. I had always wanted to do theater and uh, didn't have the nerve to do it. And I actually got asked by Mel Brooks to audition for um, the producers when they were taking it into Vegas. Really? I didn't go to the audition. When they first took Big and tried to turn it into a Broadway show, I was the first person they called to do that. I didn't go to the audition, too scared. But I hit a point in my life where I had a lot of, um, well, difficulties. I, I got cancer a few times. I was in a car accident where I broke every bone in my fi face and then came out and found out I had obsessive compulsive disorder. And it was just like one obstacle after another. And for whatever reason, I got enough nerve and did summer stock in Long Beach Island, New Jersey, playing Vince Fontaine in Greece. And that's where I met Alex Brightman. And he wrote the show for me. We started it in Bloomington, Indiana, eight years ago. Then we did the Adirondack Theater Festival. And this summer, we were playing in Buffalo, New York, and uh, playing three weeks in a local theater just for fun. And the Mrs. Doubtfire tour opened in the theater next to us. And the director of Doubtfire, Steve Edlin, came to our show, I didn't know that, met me backstage afterwards and said, have you ever thought of doing this in New York? And I went, yeah, but I don't know anybody there. He made one phone call and four months later, I'm starting rehearsal here in New York and we're here for a 16 week run. So it's a miracle, but I couldn't be happier. So what's, how did that happen? You got into a car accident and then realized you had OCD because you then did a box that I remember back in the eighties or early nineties about your OCD to help others, right? Yeah, I, I did a book. Uh, I was on Dateline. I was out talking. I was a national spokesperson for two years for the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation. And the way I found out is uh, all the time I was doing Double Dare, I knew something didn't feel right, but I, I didn't have a name. And I was hosting this talk show called Biggers and Summers on Lifetime. Had a doctor on, Dr. Eric Hollander, who uh, diagnosed me on the air live. And next thing I know, I'm on Howard Stern talking to him about it. I'm on Oprah. Uh, I'm on the Today Show. I'm everywhere. And so uh, this show that we're doing now is about overcoming obstacles. Why do certain people, when there's a wall in front of them, figure out a way to go over, under, around, and through, and other people just sort of, you know, pull back and go, I I'm not doing that. And I don't know about you. I kind of have a feeling in a couple of times we've talked, you and I don't feel like we've ever worked. We, we are doing exactly what we want to do because we're passionate about it. I can't yeah. imagine getting up every day, going to a job and absolutely hating it. And so... I never accepted the word no uh, as an answer. To me, no just meant not yet. We're not ready for you yet, or I'm not ready for you yet, but we figured it out. And I was 34 before I got Double Dare, and here I am 72 doing an off-Broadway show and having the best time of my life. That's really interesting. And I, I noticed when I went on to the Life and Slimes website, it said it's really for an audience that's 12 and up because you guys do tackle mental health issues. So. Yes. How do you weave that into the show and, and what type of messages are there for, for young people that are, I'm sure, dealing with this both, you know, intensely or wondering about their friends, their classmates or what might come down the road? Initially, um, I think a lot of parents thought they were coming to see Double Dare Live and yeah. I walk out the first week or two and there were the first three rows of a bunch of four and five year olds. And this show is not for people four and five years old. We play Double Dare for 10 minutes as a reminiscence of that time of my life. But um, we talk about intrusive thoughts. Um, I would have a hard time if I went into a grocery store and I would get fixated on reading a label. Sometimes I could stand there for 10 or 15 minutes reading the same thing over and over again until it was, quote, perfect in my mind. And the reason people with OCD do that is the intrusive thoughts are driven by the fact that you say, unless I read that perfect, something bad is going to happen to my kids, my wife, my parents. And I think that a major reason I am successful is because of my obsessive compulsive disorder. I had people in LA tell me I was a pain in the butt and they would say, I'll hire you if you promise you'll just stop calling me. Um, because if somebody <laughs> said, call me, I would call them and call them and call them until they responded to me. Okay. So here's the story I was going to tell you about Grand Junior College. We had our first career day and uh, I was in charge of some young new executive from ABC by the name of Don Olmeyer. Okay. Oh, yeah. you know, so yeah. Olmeyer became 
not only at one point running all of uh, ABC Sports, but he actually at one point ran the entire network, okay? So Olmeyer was about 25. I'm going to school. I'm like 21. And he says, hey, kid, here's my phone number. Uh, if you want to look for a job this summer, call me. So I called Don Olmeyer 25, 30, 35, 40 times. He never, ever, ever returned my phone call. <laughs> Fast forward the tape. Double Dare becomes bigger than life. And I get a phone call from Disney that they're going to do their first syndicated live from Disney World a 4th of July parade. And I said, oh, uh, who's uh, directing this show? And they said, you ever heard of a guy by the name of Don Olmeyer? So Olmeyer comes out and I said, hi, Don, how are you? And he said, uh, do we know each other? And I said, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> <laughs> so he apologized and we had a great show. <laughs> so what is Nickelodeon like at the beginning? Because now we know it as this iconic American brand. But back when you are auditioning for Double Dare, you're a stand-in because somebody's saying, nah, I don't think this thing is going to work. So what are the early days of Nickelodeon like? i tell you why it worked. Because Geraldine Laybourne, who was running the place, hired the best people and let them do their jobs. And we were allowed to be creative, do things that had not been done on TV. They did a focus group. And the focus group said that kids wanted to uh, have a game show. They were living vicariously through their mom and dad watching Price is Right and uh, Wheel of Fortune, but they wanted their own. And the motto on Nick used to be the place where only kids win. And we were rewarding them for getting messy because their parents didn't want them to do that. So it was a combination of those things. And there used to be something called playground talk. And you were probably a part of that because you did not have cable. And so um, kids would go to the playground and say, there's this cool show on some network called Nickelodeon where guys jump into 5,000 pounds of baked beans. Oh, I don't have that. Well, come to my house. And I read something in Broadcasting Magazine at one point. I didn't even know broadcasting exists anymore. Um, the three most important people in the early days of cable, first was Larry King, because he was doing the kind of interviews that nobody had seen. The second person was Gallagher, because he was the first to do comedy specials on Showtime. And they had me as number three, because I got kids to tell their parents to go buy cable so they could see Nickelodeon. So it was a win-win for all of us. That is amazing. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I was part of that subset of kids that would hear <laughs> about Double Dare from my friends at the playground and said, we got to try to get cable. we got to try to get cable. Or we got to go over to a friend's house where there is cable. But I wonder, are you noticing from the people that come to see your show the essence of what entertainment and education, and I noticed the word compassion being used on the description of your, your show as well, yeah. that those cornerstones still draw an audience is just... You've got to you've got to still create something that people want to watch wh wherever that platform is. I'll add something here. The producers get upset. But at one point, we bring out Pickett, the big nose here in our show. And when that thing comes out, I am blown away by the reaction of the people because it takes them right back to being nine years old. You know, yeah, that is really cool. From that young man to fighting with Burt Reynolds on The Tonight Show. Think about <laughs> that. Yeah, boy, that was a night. Holy mackerel. <laughs> did you guys make up after that? No. Uh, no. He hugged me and said, I only did that because I really like you. And then he left. And, I mean, we were in the last commercial, but Jake, you know, said, hey, wait, 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 what is it going on with Bert? What happened? And, you know, he just got in a car and drove off. I get a phone call from the New York Post the next day and asked what was going on. And I said it was like doing three rounds with Muhammad Ali. And the headline in the New York Post said, next morning was Bert goes berserk on tonight and um to this day i still have people stop me in the street because everybody thought it was set up yeah. it wasn't he was just nuts that night and went crazy you can go on youtube if you just google mark summers and Bert reynolds you'll see what happened and i swear to you it just it was uh an organic thing i'm not that good of an actor i could have never faked what happened on that show <laughs> Life and Slimes of Mark Summers. This is such a cool show, certainly for people of my age that grew up with Double Dare, but also if you have older children between the ages of 12 and maybe 16, 18, there's a lot of incredible messages for you in this. It's New World Stages in Manhattan. It's on 50th between 8th and 9th. They are performing through June the 2nd. There's five shows a week, and you can get tickets online. I highly, highly suggest it. And Mark has been very kind and generous with his time multiple times in my career. So I certainly want you guys to help support him as well with this endeavor. Mark, this was great. I had no doubt that it would be, but um, 
I have great admiration for your career and for your time that you spent with me before. So thanks so much for doing it again, man. It really means a lot. Thank you. And thank you for being the pro that you are. You know, I, I generally turn these things down because I say, if you can come up with three questions that I've never been asked, I'll do your podcast. And most people don't know how to do that. But I know I didn't have to ask you that because you're a pro and you do your homework. So I'm applauding you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're too kind, man. Thanks again. I hope the show is just crazy awesome, successful for you. And I appreciate it very much. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Man, oh, man. How great is that? Just watching that back. We taped that yesterday with Mark, and that is just so cool. I mean, that that is a guy that is part of the fabric of so many of our childhoods. And, you know, I'm 44, going to be 45 in June. And like I said before, we didn't have cable until I was in high school. And yet Mark Summers was, you know, one of the most famous people in the world to me when I'm 10 years old because I would go over to my cousin's house because they had cable. Double Dare was just incredible. And one of the things that I mentioned to to Mark, and we had to kind of condense that because we ended up doing more than 20 minutes there, so we had to kind of cut it down, you, you know, to some of the edits, was that big nose that kids would stick their hands in to pick, to grab the flag, I always found to be so incredible. And I I, th I thought about this when we had Mark on the show when we had the conversation with him yesterday, that it's really monumental because picking your nose is such an, a kid joke. It is not an adult joke. Picking your nose is a kid joke. And when the whole show is wrapped around picking a guy's nose to go get a flag, it's like, oh, that's for me. That's my sense of humor. That's my gross-out sense of humor because I'm on the playground or I'm on the bus or I'm in school, and those are the types of things we're joking about. And that makes such an impact that a young person, oh, that's my sense of humor there. So having Mark join us is awesome. And if you don't know what happened with him and, and Burt Reynolds on The Tonight Show, it is wild. In 1994, he goes on the show. Burt Reynolds is the main guest with Jay Leno, and then Mark Summers is the second guest. And Burt Reynolds is just in a really nasty mood. He's on the chair next to him. So he's not even being interviewed. Mark is being interviewed by Jay Leno. And he makes some off, offhanded comment to Mark Summers. And, and Summers kind of answers to Jay Leno. And Burt Reynolds snidely says, you know, don't, talk, don't turn your back to me. Something like that. Summers kind of thinks that he's joking. So he says something back. And it ends up with Burt Reynolds spilling water in the lap of Mark Summers. So it just goes from zero to 10 immediately because of Burt Reynolds. They then kind of get into a tiff. Summers is trying to stay lighthearted, but ultimately Summers pours water in Burt Reynolds' lap. So now it's really tense and Leno can't get control of anything. And remember, this is right after Leno gets the, gets the show. I'm pretty sure that Carson's last show is May of 93, May of 92 or May of 93. So it's the first two years or a year that Leno's on the show and, and hosting, and he completely loses control of it. He's kind of like, what the hell is going on? It's an amazing clip. It ends up with pies in each other's faces. They start throwing pies at Jay Leno. As you heard from Summers, this gets written up in the New York Post. Summers and him never made up. It is so wild. You can view that on YouTube after this show is over if you want to check out the actual clip. But I had to ask Mark Summers about the vintage Burt Reynolds clip on The Tonight Show. Ah, the 90s. All right, before we get going any further, a little reminder, there's still Golden Grams out there. Send us a, a picture of what you're drinking or what you're doing as you watch the show. Maybe how you're watching, if it's on a laptop, on your phone, or perhaps on a smart TV like I've got on my wall right now. And just hit me up on Instagram with it. Post it on Instagram and tag me at Damon Amendo. And we'll throw those in later on to the show in Golden Grams as in Instagrams. Okay? But let's get going into the next two of the Furious Five. And, you know, the Furious Five are one of the coolest old school hip hop bands of all time so we had to honor them with five sports subjects plus one non-sports subject but they're 
you saw them there. I mean, they're just like early 80s, all the way cool, as you can see. It's just, you know, village people combined with hip hop, combined with like plugging your stereo into a, a lamp post. Though so those guys knew how to be cool. I know that. So my next point that I wanted to talk about was OJ and his passing this week. And I just think that OJ Simpson and his passing is really notable in this way. There are two dynamic different lives that O.J. Simpson lives in the public eye. The first part is that he's a hero. He's a football hero. He's an actor. He's so smooth. I saw on Instagram this week a clip of him hosting SNL in 1978 in his monologue, and I was like, Actors don't do this as well as a former athlete did it. He was so natural on the air. Now, his Monday Night Football stance was widely panned. But from an acting standpoint, in in Naked Gun, he's hysterical. Just his on-air charm was, was quite effervescent. So you have that. And then 1994, the murders happen. And then he becomes, the moment that happens, the biggest clown ever. And from there on, he was seen as a punchline, the joke and a bad guy, just deplorable. I mean, and and when he was on Twitter, Instagram, and social media in the last couple of years, it was always such a joke. It was like, this is, it's so stupid. He's so pathetic. You retweet it or, you know, you talk about it. So I don't know if there's ever been a life in American culture that went from so high to so low with two distinct book and parts of your life and it obviously is the line of demarcation is the night of the murders in 1994 but i would say this i said this on the air this week to anybody that's under the age of say 30 it is virtually impossible to describe how it felt to watch a slow speed highway chase of one of the biggest stars in the world certainly one of the biggest stars in america flee from the cops at 60 miles an hour down the freeway as we all just assumed he was going to commit suicide by the end of it. It was gripping. It was tragic. It was ridiculous. It was absurd. It didn't end up that way, but it didn't stop anybody from thinking that was going to happen. It is one of the most bizarre moments in in American history. And uh, one of my buddies said that he saw a number that the final ep- or the the trial verdict got like 150 million viewers or something like that. That's more than half of the American population at that time. And it was done in the middle of the day. I remember being in school and then wheeling in the big old TV to watch it in class, the OJ verdict. It is so bizarre to think back to the trial of the century involving a guy that we now view as uh, unfortunately such a pathetic individual but that's what it was back then. And it's hard to put into words just how bizarre that whole time period was. Next up, uh, I want to touch on the Allen Iverson statue. This week, Allen Iverson, the answer, got a statue unveiled to him outside the Sixers practice facility. And my first thought is, was this purposefully ironic? We're talking about practice? Practice? But outside the practice facility is where the Iverson statue was, and it was notably small, the statue was. It was not life-size or larger than life like most statues are. And people clowned it, saying, how can you make an Iverson statue that's this small? It's like pocket size. And I thought the same thing. I thought, number one, why is this not outside of the actual arena? But number two, why is it small? Well, apparently at the practice facility, there's multiple statues to Sixers legends that are all that small. So it's not specific to Iverson. But man, Iverson is so iconic. Doesn't he deserve a statue at the actual arena and it being life-size? I know he never won a ring, but that 2001 season dragging them to the NBA Finals and winning a game in the NBA Finals against the iconic duo of Shaq and Kobe was pretty special. Stepping over Ty Lu. I feel like you got Dr. J and you got Allen Iverson as the icons, the bedrock of the Philadelphia 76ers. That guy deserves a full-on statue at the arena. But it's amazing also that Iverson's become such like a low-key, chill, great guy. 
because during his playing days, he was all fire. He was all fury. He was all counter culture. He was all anti-establishment. And now he's like crying at statue unveilings. He's just like the coolest guy ever. You know, Iverson, man, talk about changing the game. All right. Up our next guest. And our next guest has joined me on the radio a number of times. She's a sports betting analyst for BetMGM, for Odyssey Sports, and the BetQL Network. Let's call in our friend, Lucy Burge. Let's do it. Well, I'm very excited about our next guest here because she has joined me on my radio show before, but never here on Watch DA Live. You see her on the BetQL Network daily. This is Monday through Friday. You can see her. She appears at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And then also on Sunday nights as well on the BetQL Network. I mean, check out the names of these shows. You've got Bet Slips and Bat Flips. That's amazing. And also oh, yeah. Back to the Futures, which is plugging or tugging on my heartstrings for my nostalgia so joining us here on the show is one of my good friends lucy bird sports betting analyst lucy how you doing i'm doing great da i'm so excited to be here um and yes uh it was uh great to be on your radio show and i'm really happy to be back with you right now and those shows those titles are amazing the bet slips and bat flips show um i we just started that show uh, about a month i want to say a month ago and um when we were coming up with the name i liked that we all liked that name and i thought oh my goodness this is great then realized Throughout the show, I say it multiple times, saying this is bet slips and bat flips on the BetQL network. And I thought, oh my God, I'm this is more opportunity for me to mess up. Yeah, so I, I, I so I realizing that I was like, oh, it should just be like betting a baseball, whatever. And so it's a baseball <laughs> show. Uh, but no, it's I've I've gotten it down. Gotten it down. I can wrap M and M lines, I can say bet slips and bat flips. Like if I could do that, I could I could say that. It's really uh it gets it gets easier as you go. <laughs> You're really making your life harder than it has to be by right. making that your title. Yeah, well, like Elle Wood said in Legally Blonde, uh, she's not afraid of a challenge. So, <laughs> bed slips and bath flips. It's, if that's the toughest thing going in my life right now, I'm fine. <laughs> I go to sleep going, bed slips and bath flips, bed slips and bath flips. Bed I bed would bed too. Bed I would be so nervous about messing that up all the time. But that's good that you got this thing down. So, we just wrapped up the Masters today. And I'm wondering, now that the Masters is done, moving forward, do you have any tips for our viewers for how to bet golf moving forward? We've got a couple more majors this summer, but, you know, the Masters really started starts up the golf season. This is true. The Masters is my favorite because of the background noise, the birds and the flowers and the sunshine. And it's just beautiful, beautiful. There are other ways to bet on golf if you don't want to bet on an outright winner, because that, of course, is very tricky. I had Cam Smith for the Masters plus 4,000 heading into the tournament, but there are other ways to do this, which I am going to do more often, I think. You can bet on top 10 finish, top 20 finish. There's a little bit of wiggle room with there. There's a little bit, little, it, of course, it's it's sexier to bet on the, the one player to win. But if you want a little bit more wiggle room, I would suggest betting on so-and-so top 10 finish, so-and-so top 20 finish, because there's a little bit easier and a little more likely and there's still some value. So I think that is that is a fun way to go when you're betting on golf for the rest of the season. And was this a hard lesson to avoid betting on Tiger the rest of the year? Yes, because of course your heart always wants to bet on Tiger. But yeah. it's I not so much anymore. Like not not this tournament. This tournament I had zero interest in betting on Tiger, but in the past, of course, of course, you want to bet on Tiger Woods to win because it would be a magical story and he's Tiger freaking Woods. Of course you want to bet on him. But I wouldn't suggest it. 
maybe ever. I don't know. His, <laughs> his, back's, his back is an issue. Oh, Although no. he did the best commercial ever for a Genesis cars because that accident, that car, uh, he came out unscathed. So I, I look, I'm, that has changed my life. I think I'm going to get a Genesis. I like that. I like that idea a lot. Lucy Burge is a sports betting analyst for the BetQL Network, also Odyssey Sports and BetMGM. And her Twitter and Instagram follows are just phenomenal. She's <laughs> at Lucille Burge. I mean, just phenomenal. And every day you do a fit check. And I'm wondering, do you feel now there's more pressure to hit winning bets or to make sure your fit check is is tight? Yeah, you know, DA, you know what I'm thinking about when I go to sleep? Is it is it who who's going to be in the lineup tomorrow? Or it's what am I wearing tomorrow? I so wonder. So this is what I do. I go to sleep after I win all my bets, of course, every uh -huh. day. And I go to sleep and I'm like, all right, what are you wearing tomorrow? And I go to sleep and I think about the inventory in my closet. And I think about my <laughs> tops, what goes with what. Like, oh, tomorrow feels like a leather skirt day. And then sometimes I'll wake up and feel completely different. Like, like oh, I want to wear spring colors today. Or I want to wear leather, all oh, leather and black today. Or it, it depends <laughs> how today is a leather jumpsuit day. You know, things like that. Velvet jumpsuit day might be coming up, actually, because I saw that in my closet today and i was like how to get back into that okay. um, literally um and so i uh and so it, it you know it's it's whatever the day brings sometimes but before i go to sleep i get some ideas i'm like this is okay, the color, so, color i want to wear so your inspiration actually comes the night before it's not when you wake up and you look, look in your closet or to look yeah. at how you feel for the day it happens the night before you you process this uh, more deep data analytics that you're doing Exactly. So it's all day analytics, all day DA analytics from uh, clothes to like makeup, like, oh, well, this new makeup product. That's my, that's my little guilty pleasure. I found that that activates that part of my brain. I just look at makeup and like what's on sale and what's new okay. and what's this formula. So then I think, well, I've worn a lot of black lately. I'm going to wear a color tomorrow, like yellow, maybe yellow is a good one too. Blue perhaps. Um, but then I wake up. So that's the clothes is like night first thing in the morning. Then you move into crunching numbers. Um, so the flow of the day goes from clothes and makeup and hair to numbers, and then back to clothes, because then you do your videos, at least two, because I promote Pet MGM. And so, and then you change the outfit. You can, of course, you change the outfit for the second one, because then, oh, the, then you say, oh, the fit's changed. I and didn't so realize that. So you're doing two fit checks every single day. That's a lot. And that wardrobe changes for you. Yeah. Luckily I work from home because, you know, lugging all those clothes around would be, would be, I, uh, it would be, you know, a bit of a struggle, but uh, sometimes I wear heels with it too. So you bring different shoes, but sometimes I, I will wear like, uh, like the other day I was wearing Seinfeld sweatpants and then I changed into shorts. So it's just the flow of the day. Like, no, you know what? Maybe I'm going to wear shorts now. And then you just, you're like, okay, I'll do another video. Cause I have a different outfit and I have, are, I have other bets. Are your sweatpants from Seinfeld more Jerry or more George? They're probably more George, definitely oh. more George. They are also, I, my fit inspo for that was Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow owns the same mm. sweatpants. So mm -hmm. I, I said, you know what? I have to have these. So I was like, yeah, George Costanza, just, you know, lying around working for the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> One of the toughest things to, to bet, I think, in the NBA playoffs is whether to just go Celtics or the field, because mm -hmm. Boston's been the best team in basketball this entire season, yeah. by far and away the best record of the Eastern Conference and the NBA. And yet, Yet we sit here with a lot of early round. I wouldn't say early round, but I mean, flame outs before they even got to the finals. They've not been able to hang a banner yet. Now you've seen the Celtics as closely as anyone. So how confident do you feel about the Celtics and betting on them going into the playoffs? Yeah, DA, it is confidence level midnight I have in the Celtics coming into okay. the playoffs. Okay. This team, this team cannot, they cannot, they cannot flame out again. They can't do it because they did it last year and they just fell apart right before your eyes and you watched them. Like it felt like the TV was getting slower and slower and slower and they lost this year. They can't do that because this is championship or bust. How mortifying would that be if they fall apart again? No way. I do think it will be Celtics Nuggets finals, but I think the Celtics will be very successful in the finals. Um, I think they'll win it. Um, but I have much more confidence in the Celtics this year than I did last year because they're hungrier because in no way do they want that to happen again. So if it comes to Celtics in the field, I am taking the Celtics all day long. Also, it's it's a better team. It's a more well-rounded team. I think yeah. the Porzingis edition has been huge for them. 100%. And the holiday edition has been huge for them. So it does feel like they're better suited, I think, to win the NBA Finals this year 
unlike maybe previous years when they've had really good teams. But this year does feel like it's a level up from previous years, doesn't it? Definitely, especially with Porzingis. I think he has made a massive difference. Also, I think the combination of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, have they have to win a championship at some point. And now that they have pieces like Porzingis um, I, in the holiday, I think um, this is a team that is a championship or bust, but they are primed to win it. Like they could be like the UConn Huskies and roll right through it. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a little boring where it's like, of course the Celtics are going to win it. But with the Celtics though, UConn, you knew it. Like they've done it before. This, right. this Celtics team at any moment could fall apart. So throughout the finals, I will, and I think everybody will be scared all the time. Just scared. Like, oh, tonight's tonight. <laughs> tonight's tonight they lose everything. And tonight's tonight they fall apart and they never regain it. Um, like you just keep your composure throughout the throughout the finals and you'll be fine. Or that the finals, let's say they <laughs> throughout the playoffs. Well, I, I want to wrap up with this. I, I think one of the reasons that you're so successful is that you feel very um you feel very comfortable in front of the camera and people feel like they know you. And so you have your personality that is out there. It's not just pics. I mean, you truly, I think, connect with, oh, they're very comfortable with you. Sometimes maybe a little too comfortable with you. <laughs> they're eager to connect with me. <laughs> very, <laughs> very eager. Earlier this week, I mean, there was a tweet from you that was laugh out loud hysterical, but it was inspired by another person's response to one of your tweets. So here it is on the screen right now. Uh, we had to blur out most of what this guy, Mike F, was tweeting at you. But he said he he was very, he had a lot of affinity for you. He, I think he wanted to get to know you a little bit better. And he was willing to get to know other people better who had known you better. Uh, yes. I think that would be a way to summarize it. And you just said, sir, this is a win. <laughs> because what the hell, Mike F? This is not my DMs. I will say that I don't get that many even DMs. And I don't get DMs and I don't get DMs like this. Surprisingly, I don't. And this stopped me in my tracks. And I honestly, I let it marinate a little bit throughout the day because I was like, do I call attention to this? The day was 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 ending and I was like, you know what? This is this is still in my head. I got to do something with this because this guy, it's not like I tweeted. Like, this isn't public. This is public, sir. This is a post hog on main material. This is crazy. So all I could think of was, well, this is not the time or place for this. This is the Wendy's. This is like we can read the words you're typing. This is this guy was inspired by this. what what set him into this thinking that he was like, I have to make sure that this is in writing in public. This like is like you said, it's not a DM. This is not in private. This was a response to one of your tweets. I mean, also, <laughs> at no point in that sentence did I know what the next word was gonna be. Because that was just a graphic. <laughs> that guy wants to do a lot of things. He has got, he's very busy. <laughs> he's a very busy guy. And I don't even know in what scenario, what he's talking about. Could he even like, like there's a lot of people involved in what he's talking about. <laughs> have to coordinate times. You got to figure out what this is. It's all scheduling. It really is all scheduling. This guy has a has a planner that he writes down who, what, and when every single day. It sounds like he wants to schedule something. And Mike F, I'm sorry, but not happening. Um, but there were people who were like, this guy should be like his life should be over. And I was like, guys, it's not he he didn't, he was a compliment. I think it wasn't like it wasn't like, oh, she should die. Like, no. I mean, it's like Everybody just move on with your day. There were He's people just... that were like, I saw this. I was just scrolling, eating dinner. And I was like, so was I. Okay, just going about my day. If I have to see this, you all have to see this too. Mike F is a very busy guy. He set a lot of iPhone alarms. He just yes. wants to be punctual about yep. all the activities he's interested in. Yeah, it's a two-step process, apparently, and he wants to just do all of it. He's got like, okay, it's time for this now. Like, would you, and this, oh. like, okay, first of all, it's in his mind, and he's like, I gotta get this out of my mind. I gotta let everybody know this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I need a thirty for thirty on the, <laughs> the making of that tweet. Because <laughs> why would you do that? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, Mike, thanks for sharing. Yes, it was in his draft for a bit. And then he was like, you know what? Tweet. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Check out Lucy cool. Burge, the BetQL Network, every day, weekdays, 2 until 2.30 Eastern time, then on Sunday nights as well there. Follow her on Instagram and on X at Lucille Burge. She's the best. She's on the BetQL Network. She's on the Odyssey Sports Network. She's also on BetMGM, so she's all over the place. And she's very kind enough to spend some time with us. And she's got a great sense of humor. And we appreciate that very much. We like to laugh around here. And uh, you do it as well as anybody. So, Lucy, thanks so much for joining us. I, I hope we can make this a regular event here. I really hope so. The honor and pleasure is all mine. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I, I am back anytime. Mike Kev is just a very busy guy. Obviously, it's a very busy guy. Woof. That tweet. Woof. woof. Man, that was very graphic, very aggressive. Lucy's great. She can laugh at herself. She can laugh at other people. That's why we love having her here on the show. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So appreciate Lucy stopping on by. Okay. Two more. For the Furious Five, before we get to the Q and D A portion of the show, the Furious Five plus one, the final sports story of the night is Tom Brady earlier this week leaving the door open on potentially coming back. And I have to be honest, I frankly am a Tom Brady cynic in this way. I think that Tom Brady is now at the point of his career, and he reached this point about. Three years left in his career, four years left in his career. The last year in, in, in New England, the last three in Tampa, were about building conversation around Tom Brady. This was clearly a priority. He did the Tom versus Time series with, was it Facebook? He had the Facebook show where it's with his family. He had so many documentary pieces in uh, social media th- uh, projects that went out there to create conversation that this was always part of his game plan by the end of his career become as big of a star or celebrity as you could get people talking so that when you then graduate into your post-playing career you have some leverage from a celebrity standpoint and it worked great he signed that deal with fox yada 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 he should be on games this fall let's see but it is so funny that he signs a deal with Fox and then takes a year off. Signs a deal with Fox and now says, but I would be open to coming back. I mean, so very clearly he doesn't necessarily need to be calling games. <laughs> you know, not something that he's dying to do because he's put this off for a year and said, and if somebody calls me, I would put it off again. I don't think he's coming back because I don't think anybody would. I shouldn't say this. Somebody might call him at 47 years old because the NFL is desperate and look at some of the bozos that were playing by the end of last year due to injury. But I I don't think he would come back because I don't think he would want to come back and embarrass himself. And I think when you've been away from the game for two years, you would not put yourself in that situation. So chalk this up into the category of, I think Brady's just saying this because he knows this gets the headlines aggregated around the internet. It is what it is. All right. The final story of the Furious 5 Plus 1 is a non-sports story, as we always do. And how about this? Gordon Ramsay has a pub, okay, in London. And I can tell you that I've drank a lot of places in my life, all right? And London's my favorite pub culture there is. And I really love pub culture. I just think it's so inviting. When I went to London, my wife brought me out there for my 40th birthday and we went to go see two soccer matches, something I always wanted to do. We went to go see a Liverpool match and a Tottenham match. And in London, we stayed in London and we went to a couple of pubs. And I just said, this is, this is who I am. This is really who I've always been meant to be. This is sitting at a pub and it's great in London. There aren't TV screens all over the place for sports. They don't have TVs on. You're supposed to sit there, drink a pint, and talk to the guy next to you or talk to the gal next to you or, I guess, sit on your phone. But it is really about this communal idea of being somewhere and drinking and talking. 
And what are the two things I might like doing better than anything else? Drinking and talking. And so cheers to all of that. And thanks everybody for sharing that with me because I just think it's a tremendously unifying and communal experience to sit around, to have a cocktail, have a beverage, and just talk to people. It opens people up. It creates conversation because you're sitting there and there's nothing else to do except talk to them. And I I just think that that's so important in life to be able to communicate with people around you that maybe you're not familiar with to, to hear from them, to hear their stories. And I that's kind of why I do what I do. And so the pub culture is just my favorite bar culture in the world that I've been to because it is all bent around here's your pint here's your bar stool and the rest is up to you I love that so Gordon Ramsay has a pub out there and he's trying to sell it now because it's in between sales nobody's going to this pub any, every night so there's a group of 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 squatters who have gone in there and they're just staying there now. They are just staying in this pub. And Gordon Ramsay is threatening legal action, but there's protection for squatters in London. There are six freeloaders that are just staying in there. And they're just living in there. One, this is how it is described by Yahoo News. A slipper-wearing occupier was scrolling through his smartphone with tobacco, empty water bottles, and wine glasses on the floor around him. A blue sleeping bag was dumped on another sofa with a pair of crutches also visible. There's a guy with crutches staying in Gordon Ramsay's couch in his pub. Then they can't kick him out because they're just squatting their squatters' rights. Oh, my goodness. Could you imagine? Again, it's why I love pub culture. These six guys just like, you know what? Gordon Ramsay's pub is empty. Nobody's coming there every night. Let's just go there and stay there. We're going to lock the doors. They've glued the lock shut. So you can't get in. You can't get out. They're just staying in there. I don't know how much food they have in there, but this is pretty brilliant. Maybe there's a window you could open up so the door dash can come in. I think this is great. Wouldn't you love to just squat at Gordon Ramsay's pub, especially in London, one of the best pub cities ever for a couple weeks? I got nothing to do. I'm unemployed. I'm just going to stay at Gordon Ramsay's pub. Great. This story is amazing. Amazing. All right. That is the end of the Furious 5 plus 1. And uh, I want to, before we get out of here tonight, of course, do a little Q&DA, which is where we take your comments, and Aiden just picks them at random, and he throws them on the screen, and I have to react to them. So, if you want to get your question asked or answered, I should say, do it up. Just send us a, a comment during the show, and I will answer them at your behest. All right, let's do a little Q&A as we wrap up the show. Aiden, send us something. All right, Spencer says, Tiger Woods versus Mike Tyson, one golf match, two boxing match, three twister competition. It's Mike Tyson because Tyson defeats Tiger Woods in less than one round, even at this age. If Tyson's is trying, let's assume that you have Tyson at a competitive level 10. So it's a knockout of the first round. You can't beat Tyson for the equivalent in, well, maybe you can. All right, so can Tyson beat Tiger in boxing easier than Tiger thing can beat Tyson in golf? And then the X factor is Twister. Yeah, you know what? Advantage Tyson because the body of Tiger is just mangled at this point. So I don't think I don't think he's got any flexibility, no spinal flexibility, no ankle flexibility. His ankle's fused. His spine is all messed up. So yeah, advantage Tyson. But I mean, we don't even get to Twister because. Tyson could lose by 70 strokes on the golf course, but Tiger's left eye socket is broken after you know, Tyson gets done with it. So it's advantage Tyson. All right, next up on Q&DA, Matt says, if there was one physical challenge that you would be dared to do, what would it be? Let me tell you, today I, I go to the gym on the weekends. Uh, I try to get there once a week. Not great, but 
It's a pretty good little boot camp on a Saturday or Sunday morning at AR Fit Athletic Republic. They're all across the country. They do circuit training, and I love it because it's not like lifting. That's not good for my skeleton. I did a lot of running when I was younger. My knees are not great because of it, so I don't like to just run on the treadmill or whatever. So it's it's quick. It's circuit training. It's good. It's core strength. And we did something called the blast button. That's not right. Anyway, there's like four different light up buttons that you have to shuffle side to side like a crab and then hit as they light up. I actually was second best of the class that beat me today had done it multiple times. I actually got better as I went on. I started realizing like spatial, you know, differentials. So I think if there was a physical challenge, if you could give me like these blast buttons or whatever they call them with a big nose that you could stick a hand in to pull a flag out, then I probably would be good at that. Like if I if a if a nose lit up and I have to shuffle side to side like a crab and then grab the flag, that'd probably be it. But I always felt like I would be really good at double dare because I can fling my body around quite a bit. I when I was younger, I've always been, you know, thin for my age group. And when I was young, I was small for my age group. So I would always just kind of like fling my body around if it was diving for a pass or diving for a, a ground ball or diving for a loose ball in basketball. Like I was never a- afraid of that. And so I think a double dare kind of fit that sensibility of if you can fling your body because you're young and you're small and you're light at the flag here or at the nose there in this bucket of baked beans, you usually have an advantage the people that hesitated or were slow to the flag always lost slow to the whatever you were doing before the flag so i I just think generally i always thought that i'd be pretty good at double there as like 10 year old da i mean i was probably like 10 years old i was four eight and a hundred pounds or something i mean probably less so like that there's a there's an advantage for the small scrappy guy there that i'm built like a slot receiver so there you go Right next up, Aiden. Curtis says, first Mark Summers, who's next? Any chance you can get Bo Jackson? Curtis, let me just tell you this. And King Curtis has been here with us since episode one. And I know all the folks that have been here commenting since episode one. And I thank you so much because we love doing this. Myself, Aiden, who's the executive producer. And we're starting to build a little army here, a little team behind the scenes that are like, no, we think what what you guys are doing is awesome. We want to be part of it. It's so inspirational because this is like a dream project to do. And the people that are doing it are all just totally supportive that we totally know the listeners that have been here, the audience that's been here for a while. And Curtis is one of them. And Mark Summers is the start of, I I just think like pretty awesome guests that we're getting because we're starting to build a bit of a reputation where it's, oh, we saw, you know, Ari Shafir was on the show, and oh, we saw Mark Selmer was on the show, and oh, we saw Andrew Catalan was on the show, and oh, we saw Kyle Pitts was on the show, and oh, we saw, you know, people are starting, to, like, it's easy to sell to PR people and easy to sell to guests. Oh, we had X, Y, and Z on. They're like, oh, what you're doing is really cool. We've seen it on social. We've seen it on, you know, X. We've seen it on uh, YouTube. So it's just been so cool, and we've only been doing this for, this is the fourth episode, the fifth episode, I mean, a month and a half or so. So I don't know what the next guest is, but We've got big goals. I can tell you that we have a production meeting every Monday or Tuesday and me and the team uh, and Aiden and the team, we kind of get together and we're like, well, who'd be cool this week? Who'd be cool next week? Like who's doing what? And we've got some, we got some big names on the, uh, the to-do list. So stay tuned because it's pretty awesome. And I'm very excited about what we're building around here. Next up. What do we got here on Q and DA? Aiden, hit me. Ralph says, bring back Canadian bacon. Bring back the oinks. Oh, Ralph, you're a man after my own heart. So the NHL playoffs are right around the corner. The NBA playoffs are right around the corner. And if you're a fan of my uh, radio show, you've heard Canadian bacon before. It's how we deliver the Stanley Cup postseason through catchphrases and song and grading through oinks. And I want to reimagine that here on watch da live i'm gonna have to get clearance from you know the guys that are part of it because i want to make sure the guys that have always been part of it want to do it but if they're willing to do it i'm willing to bring it to you because i want to laugh the same way that we always laughed around as the stanley cup playoffs so believe me we've had conversations about it 
and I tend to believe that it's going to happen, and the playoffs are here, so it's time to to hit the road and do it, right? Rubber hits the road here. So stay tuned because I think we got something good brewing here. First up is Aiden eating the most sour candy on earth, and then second is perhaps a little Canadian bacon. All right, we'll wrap up with the last comment. Matt says, DA, do the old school little wet little drippy koozies still exist in your attic somewhere or are those long gone? Great question. Once upon a time, a great drop on the DA show was little wet, little drippy, which was from a, uh, a viral video of the brother of a high-end basketball recruit. A lot to explain, but I always thought that was so funny to describe something as little wet, little drippy as though it was cool. And uh, we did that on koozies for the DA show. We do have little wet, little drippy koozies somewhere in my cabinet. In the, I don't even think it's the attic. I think it's in the kitchen. I think my mother-in-law has a few of them. I see them pop up every so often at like a barbecue in the summer. But I can tell you, again, this is good. You guys are in my mind. I've got designs on Watch DA Live koozies for the summer. So if you're watching right now and you have a beverage in hand, could be even a spike seltzer, which you guys know I'm anti, but I'm going to give it to you this summer. If you have a beer, a can, a, a truly, uh, whatever, I think we're going to do some Watch DA live koozies and send them out to our, to, to our lucky winners here on a couple of different contests, okay? So, yes, there's little wet, little drippy koozies somewhere out there, but I'm going to say that there's, there's new ones coming and they're going to be badass going to be really badass, all right? And uh, Cigar City Capo mentions that it, Mo Bamba. That's right. Mo Bamba! Mo Bamba's brother around the pool said Little Wet, Little Drippy, and Mo Bamba became a, a hip-hop song. I mean, it's just, there's a butterfly effect here that we can go into at a different time. Uh, I want to wrap up here with your momentous moment of the week because um, I want to honor my friend, little Mo, Mo Gabba, who was one of the greatest inspirations in my life. And the city of Baltimore honored him with, he's part of the Orioles Hall of Fame, the Ravens Hall of Fame. Mo is in the Baltimore text in the end zone of the Ravens. And I was just down in Baltimore last week and then handing out the little Mo Gabba Courage Award. And uh, I just, I want to make sure that we always have him as part of our show because I know he's looking down at all of us and he's laughing and he's giggling and he loves that we're doing this every single Sunday. Believe me, he's that type of kid. He's still watching over all of us. And I have his bobblehead in my room, in my office. I have a framed picture of a, a painting of him as well. And I think about him all the time. And I've got two t-shirts, three t-shirts uh, of four mode that I wear all the time as well. So your momentous moment of the week. How about a Daisy Ridley film that is coming out? Daisy Ridley, of course, is the star of the newest Star Wars movies, and she was excellent in them. She was one of my favorite casting decisions that they made for the new trilogy of Star Wars. But she is starring in a movie called Young Woman in the Sea, and this is actually going to be produced by Jerry Bruckheimer. And it is about a woman from the early 20s named Gertrude Ederly, Trudy Ederly, who was the first female to uh, ru uh, to swim the English Channel, but she did so in record-breaking time. She beat everybody's record when she did it, and her story is amazing because she grew up swimming in a public pool. And I just think in today's day and age, of course, times have changed 100 years later, but when everything is so specialized and you have to be on travel teams, and you have to be part of the elite athletic competition in your town to then be funneled into all these other things. I think it's just the message of, man, the, the fastest person in the world swimming the English Channel who happened to be a female, she trained in a public pool in her city, in her town, is pretty badass. And she contracted measles when she was young so she had she was hard of hearing and after she did this and set the world record she taught deaf swimmers to her children to swim when they were young and you could imagine how intimidating it is to get in the pool if you're a uh, a, ch a child you're somebody young and you are hard of hearing or you can't hear at all and she understood how to connect with them. And so I just think she's such an inspirational story in sports. Trudy Eberly, that there's a movie coming out about her, which is awesome. And that she trained in the public pool, 
lost some of her hearing when she was young and then helped train deaf children to be comfortable in the pool is so phenomenal. So she is an awesome icon that so many people don't know about. I didn't know it until I read the story about Daisy. And uh, I just think she's this it is so cool that Daisy Ridley is playing her in this movie. And I think her story is amazing. So that's how we're going to leave tonight's show. This was so much fun. Congratulations to our winners of the Bakta Bourbon Bracket Bash. They've been amazing since we started this thing. And thanks to all the listeners out there that have been with us since day one or building as well. If you tell your friends, hey, you got to listen to or watch watch DA Live every Sunday night. It's become such a cool community. I hear from people on social all the time. Oh, you're my Sunday tradition. You're what I'm doing every week now. I'm getting ready for the rest of the week. And we're watching as a family or me and my husband or me and my wife or whatever. I love it. So thank you so much. Thanks to executive producer Aiden Hatton. As always, the Marquette Marvel crushing it as always. I throw a lot of stuff against the wall. He's going to make it stick, and he does. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Salute. Good health. Be one with your community, and we'll see you next week as well. The Mothership disconnects.